Welcome. To fix this, hold on just a second. Sorry, I'm late. I was trying to chase down Baracus. He's uh, not being cooperative. I don't know what happened. <laughs> he said he was a. Uh, no, he's just playing with everybody else, and he didn't want to come play with me. That's all right. We'll play. Mm. All right. Are you ready? Sorry, we need to catch up. Yes, of course we do. All right. Now you get to figure out why Madisei acted so uncharacteristically on top of the pyramid. As soon as Jacinto snapped the latches and lifted up the top of the case, Madisei opened the blankets and placed a beautifully carved box inside, then slammed the lid. Afterward, she and Jacinto had... Oh, wait a minute. No, we're in the wrong place. Here we go. Here we go. She placed the black plastic pelican case on top of the table much more gently as she quickly assessed her blatant disregard of the proper protection protocols for archaeological finds. She didn't catalog the find correctly. She didn't handle the artifact correctly. Hell, she didn't do anything right. The only thing she cared about was getting it outside and finding out what the writing on it said. To hell with the rules. And these were her own rules that she had broken. And she started breaking them almost from the moment she opened the case and shone her light on the impossible crystal-like object on the inside of the intricate mahogany box. Marise would never know, but that was exactly the moment the god in the clear rock started to awaken. The god in the clear rock is waking up. Uh-oh. All right, here we go. See if I can get it to work this time. Yes, it did want to work. After we script that, I figured out what I did wrong. But it's not bringing that up. So now we have our crawl. We got the book up there. Got the timer. I'm getting ready to go over and start the timer. Oop. Here we go. Timer's way. After she finished the call with JL earlier, Madise got redressed on top of the pyramid. Then she started down the side and found Jacinto unconscious next to the blanket wrapped mahogany box. She poured water over her dehydrated, overheated, and possibly overstimulated assistant until he regained consciousness and could walk down on his own but she carried the box down to the campsite herself. Their base camp was inside the jungle overgrowth in a clearing made under the canopy. This was where the sleeping tents for her and Jacinto were located, as well as several storage and work tents. The jungle canopy provided both shade and protection from the rains. It was also where she kept all of the equipment when it wasn't being used on the plaza or inside the pyramid. After he had quickly cooled off at the campsite, Jacinto went to the main storage tent and received the black pelican case used for transporting one of their computers. Marise had gone straight to the large work tent with the artifact. Jacinto arrived a moment later and put the case on the table next to the blanket covered box. Most archaeological finds could never be transported in this manner, but the regular rectangular shape of the artifact would allow it to be protected completely in the case. Marise had suddenly become so concerned about the total lack of proper protocol regarding this find, she wanted to get it inside the airtight case immediately. As soon as Jacinto snapped the latches and lifted up the top of the case, Marise opened the blankets and placed a beautifully carved box inside, then slammed the lid. Afterward, she and Jacinto had gone to their tents to pack for a trip to Miami which was scheduled to start about 45 minutes later when JL's helicopter was to arrive. That was 44 minutes ago. Now, as she looked at the Pelican case while they waited for the helicopter to arrive, she realized that she hadn't actually seen, she hadn't actually seen the artifact since they both found it underground a couple hours ago. 
Suddenly, Marise felt a compulsion to open the box. Almost unconsciously, she reached out and snapped the latches around the case. The interior of the case was lined with corrugated foam that held the dark mahogany box in place when closed. Two cotton gloves were in a crumpled bunch next to the carved mystery. While she was looking at the box, her hands reached out and slipped on the cotton gloves. Only after the gloves were on both her hands did she actually see them. Then, as if she couldn't help herself, she reached in and lifted the lid off the box. As she pulled the lid out of the pelican case and set it to the side on the table, the ambient light of day filtered through the sheer covered cloth onto the gleaming surface of the clear tablet for the first time in over four centuries. The work table was under the small tent on the east side of the plaza, which allowed the setting sun to shine under the tent and illuminate the work area with the same golden amber glow that was covering the jungle and her pyramids. This was the main reason she put this work tent here. The light was not only perfect for working in the late afternoon, but it was beautiful too. Madise pulled back the thin material covering the tablet with her gloves. She started to lean in and look, but another compulsion made her move to the side. When she did, the rays of the setting sun shone down and directly hit the surface of the clear stone. The intricate carvings exploded with rainbows of prismatic light that seemed to move as she stared, almost mesmerized. Asinto broke her spell when he walked up and blocked the sunshine with his body. Wow, look at that thing sparkle in the light. Asinto seemed oblivious to his position in front of the sun. Marise didn't move, but she had this strange vision in her mind of shoving Jacinto out of the way of the sunshine so she could look at the beautiful lights again. But before she could follow that impulse and push him out of the way, the sound of a helicopter popped out from behind the pyramid on the far end of the plaza. Both of them snapped their heads around to see. When they did, the sunshine temporarily blinded them. Suddenly, Marise snapped out of the daze she was in. She grabbed the wooden top and gently placed it back over the artifact, then threw in the gloves and closed the pelican case. Then she looked down at her watch. Ninety minutes. Exactly when J.L. said the helicopter would arrive. This new J.L. was not at all like the J.L. she remembered from college. This one was on time. Well, at least the people who worked for him were on time. Jacinto interrupted her thoughts. Man, I didn't even hear it coming. Marise grabbed the case, and they both stepped outside the tent. It's the canopy. The sound is absorbed very effectively if the helicopter flies low and fast. As she said this, a bright blue helicopter swung out from the other side of the enormous pyramid and banked nearly on its side as it screamed around in a tight circle and headed straight for the tent with Marise and Asinto. Unbelievably quick, the helicopter flared up its front end and slid to an airborne stop over the exact middle of the plaza. The tail rotor of the helicopter stayed about five feet off the flat rock surface as the body of the helicopter slowly swung down and settled into a level hover. Then, as softly as a feather, the helicopter pilot set the $20 million luxury aircraft down. Jacinto looked at the helicopter. Then he looked at his boss. Whose helicopter is this again? Jacinto had never seen a helicopter like this one before. He was expecting some typical military surplus chopper left over from some Russian or U.S. conflict somewhere. That was the only type of helicopter he had ever seen in this country. But this one was different. It was brand new for starters. Or at least it looked that way. While he stared at the helicopter, he saw the door open and the pilot motioned for them. Marise walked past him with the pelican case as Jacinto grabbed both bags and jogged up to her. Minutes later, they were strapping themselves into their seats inside the luxury chopper. As Jacinto looked around, he realized how big it was. The interior of the helicopter was like a custom jet. Four oversized chairs on the rear bulkhead faced the front of the cabin. Two more overstuffed captain's chairs sat on each side of the small passage to the cockpit 
with two jump seats next to each door. After Marise strapped in, she put on the headset and motioned for Jacinto to do the same. Just then, the pilot came on the audio. Everyone buckled in? He leaned over and looked back. His passengers both gave him a thumbs up. Settling back into his seat, he began takeoff. Roger that. Hold on to your hat. As the helicopter shot up into the air, Marise looked out of the large viewing window. Below her, in the, fa in the falling light of the sun, she saw her pyramid and the plaza from a perspective that the original inhabitants never had. Unlike on his arrival, this time the pilot rose straight up until they were about 1,000 feet over the center of the compound, then slowly rotated around. Is this what you wanted, Dr. Sanchez? The pilot's voice crackled over the headset. Yes, this is perfect. Can we stay here for a moment more? I've never actually seen my sight from the air. Yes, ma'am. I'll have to leave in a few minutes to get you to the airport on time. That's fine, thank you. Marise was mesmerized looking out the large window. Jacinto, on the other hand, had his eyes closed. He was afraid of heights, and this slow rotation was making his head spin and his stomach churn. It felt like an elevator ride from hell. He was okay with airplanes, but he'd never actually been in a helicopter. Now he was regretting ever agreeing to this trip. He gripped the armrest so hard his knuckles were turning white. From this height, Marise could clearly see the white gravel roads that were barely visible from the top of the pyramid. They were covered with a light-colored rock that contrasted against the green canopy surrounding them. And from this height, the four roads pointed into the pyramid complex like a crosshair on a target. As the helicopter stopped spinning and started for the airport in Chichen Itza, she couldn't help wonder what they could have been used for. She sat back into her chair for just a moment while she daydreamed on the question. Then she looked over to Asinto. His eyes were still closed, and he still had the armrest in a death grip. She smiled as she realized he must not like flying or heights. What about the other call? Did you get through? She figured talking might help. Jacinto didn't answer immediately. Hasi, did you reach your father? Marise reached out and gently placed her hand on his arm. The flight had settled down from the initial hovering, and the helicopter was now traveling at a couple of hundred knots and a few thousand feet up. From here, it felt more like a small plane. Jacinto opened his eyes and looked at Marise. He visibly calmed when he looked past her and saw they were flying, not spinning. Sorry, boss. Yeah, I reached him. He tried to smile, but it looked broken. Marise couldn't help it and broke out laughing. Slowly, Jacinto started to laugh, too. After a few minutes of laughing, they were both relaxed. Jacinto smiled genuinely and looked at Marise. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. I didn't get to see my family. I didn't think I'd get to see my family until spring. Marise smiled at him. Don't thank me. JL specifically told me to bring you. He remembered you had family back in Miami. Before she could continue, the pilot came over the headset. I'm sorry, Dr. Sanchez. I'm not used to carrying passengers that aren't familiar with the amenities. There's a full bar in front of the cabin. JL told me to give you the complete package. I should have offered you a drink before I took off, but feel free to get up and fix yourself anything you want. I believe you'll find it stocked quite sufficiently, even if you just want water. We have about a half an hour until we're on the ground at the airport. As Marise was thanking the pilot, Jacinto jumped out of his seat and leapt to the front of the cabin where the custom bar was mounted on the, bul on the bulkhead. When he opened the cabinet, he found himself staring into a bottle of Patron Grand Boudoir Tequila. Jacinto had seen a bottle once before and knew that it sold for about $500 per bottle. Then his jaw fell open as he looked at the other bottles of expensive alcohol. He quickly gained his composure and grabbed the Patron along with two shot glasses and a lime from the small bin. 
Then he shut the cabinet and went back to his seat. He handed Marise the bottle of tequila and pulled up the seat tray from the arm of the captain's chair. After he retrieved his pocket knife from his shorts, he sat down and sliced the lime into thick wedges, like he was carving an apple in his hand. Marise took the top off the Patron and was about to fill the two shot glasses when Jacinto stopped her. <clears throat> Let me, your highness... Jacinto didn't want Marise to look too closely at the bottle. If she knew how much it cost, she might not let them drink it. But Marise didn't really look at it and handed over the bottle. Jacinto poured two shot glasses and stowed the bottle on the seat next to him. Then they both grabbed a shot glass and a wedge of lime. They clinked the glasses together and shot, shot the dark tequila in one big gulp. Like they were synchronized, both of them put the lime in the shot glass and set it on his tray at the same time. Limes are for pussies, they both said together, then broke out laughing. The pilot looked back from the cockpit when he heard this. He smiled when he saw the bottle of Patron. Then he went back to flying. But moments later, the sound of electric guitar started playing softly in the background of everyone's headsets. The pilot's voice came over the audio, and he sounded like an old FM disc jockey. And now, for your listening pleasure, a little Frank Zappa called Shut Up and Play Your Guitar. Now, I'm going to shut up and fly this bird. The amazing riffs played in the background of their headphones as Jacinto poured another round of the smooth agave liquor that cost more than either of them could afford on their salaries. Okay, boss, fess up. What's going on between you and this Farnsworth? I know you went to college with him, but this guy is really rich. Why would he do all this just to help you out? Marise shot the tequila before answering. She realized she hadn't eaten anything since this morning, and she could feel the warmth in her belly while the ghost of Zappa played on the headphones. Then she smiled a devilish grin sideways at Jacinto. What? You see me naked, and then you think I'm just going to spill my guts? Then she grabbed a lime wedge and squeezed it into her mouth. Jacinto was feeling the tequila, too, because suddenly he was not embarrassed anymore. He poured another round as an answer to her playful jab and handed her the shot glass. Here's to no secrets. Then he shot his down. No secrets except the price of this tequila, he guiltily thought to himself. But he quickly got over it. So, what's the deal? And we're going to stop there because the timer's been out. <laughs> oh, I love this. This is awesome. Okay. And you're going to work. Awesome, you work. Hey, let's go over here and see. Is there anything happening? Was there a live stream? Yes. There was, and there it is. See... Oh, there we go. Now I can turn off the volume so I don't see anything in there. Oh, do I see anybody? Nope, not seeing anybody, but that's okay. Here, I'll show you what I was looking at. It's right here. Where's the internet? Is it here? Yeah, there it was right there. Yep. See? So that's live. Yep. Okay. Well, nobody's talking, so it's like I'm talking to the void. You know, it was different. I was involved in the early days in podcasting, the really, really early days. And uh, it was different back then. Everybody liked to talk, communicate, because this was all brand new. Now it's just old. Everybody can do it. Kids can do it. YouTube's just made it not so cool that, you know, people want to pay attention. Anyway, I hope you guys are enjoying this, because I'm enjoying it. It's keeping me from going crazy during the, uh, during the quarantine. And uh, I will see you guys tomorrow which will be wednesday it's 9 22 and so i'm gonna go tell my kids good night Just the facts, ma'am.
tonight's show is from Curious Lucian. He has the good Lucian. Not like the other Lucian. The other Lucian. He has bad Lucian. 